You just missed the stare of that. <laughs> okay, good evening, everyone. Um, and welcome to uh, this joint LSE Law School and Grant Research Institute supported event, which asks the question, where next for European climate change litigation? Um, and we to introduce the panel and everything in a moment, but just first to situate that question um, a little bit for you. Um, well, clearly in the past eight years, one of the most remarkable phenomena to occur in the field of not just climate change law and governance, but environmental law and governance generally has been the emergence of litigation as really an essential tool in the toolbox for climate change governance. And from some corners, looking at it from some corners, that's a little bit surprising in a way, because when we say climate change governance, in climate change governance, typically you, you think about, well, that requires a lot of policy to put into practice. And when we think about policy, development of policies and their implementation, the key actors that you would be thinking of in the first place would be governments, would be regulatory agencies, would be epistemic communities, et cetera. You wouldn't in the first place think of courts, which seem sort of, you know, rather kind of adversarially oriented institutions to be involved in this governance project. Um, and another reason why it might strike us as a little bit surprising that litigation is such a key tool in climate change governance is that, well, if we look at the history of both environmental and climate change uh, litigation, we'll see that, well, you know, embarking on litigation with the aim of achieving environmental goals, but it's not for the faint of heart. There are a lot of really quite sort of like um, daunting and a lot of discouraging scary precedents there. And that's the case for environmental litigation, certainly the case for the kind of the first, as uh, we sometimes refer to the first waves of climate litigation that happened uh, in the you know, 2000s to 2010, 12, 11. Um, so from that perspective, it's, it's rather surprising that litigation is now such a pivotal component of climate change governance. But then on the other hand, of course, when we think, for example, of the fact that all well, the stakes are so massively high now, maybe from that perspective, it's not that surprising that courts also, as major social actors, that they would also, one way or another, get involved in this. And also, of course, we're aware of the fact that those parties that might be sort of the, the more kind of natural deliverers of governance, we know they often fall short. We know that, for example, that governments often fail to deliver the climate change policies and climate change laws and regulations that are really commensurate to the problem. We know there are collective action problems. We know also that they are under pressure from vested interests to try and kind of like um, hold off the, the uh, major or radical changes. And of course, when that when that is the case, that means that we need other actors also to get in on the act. And one of the key acts there hasn't even been the court. And what we've noticed um, in uh, the past 10, uh, eight to 10 years, there have been a few remarkable developments really in this field of climate change litigation. First, it's definitely, while of course certain jurisdictions are more litigious than others, and that's no different for climate change litigation. We do see that litigation is happening everywhere, and it's, it's happening across continents, and it's becoming really a kind of trans-jurisdictional phenomenon. So this is an issue that the entire world is uh, confronting and is grappling with at the moment. Um, and also the other um, noticeable aspect here is that we see quite a broad range of different sort of litigation pathways developing. There's, for example, there's quite a bit of litigation that basically is uh, public law litigation, uh, and that is essentially centered around judicial review, where the actions of public authorities are measured against the public law standards that they are supposed to uphold. Um, and that's one avenue for climate change litigation. 
Then there's also, of course, also there's the the um, the private law avenue for climate change litigation. We see torts being used as as uh, ways of um, challenging not only the climate responsible or irresponsible behavior of private actors, but also of public authorities. We see nuisance and negligence uh, claims um, developing. So there's this, that, that avenue. Then increasingly also company law is constituting a basis for a number of claims uh, where basically climate, either climate misinformation or mismanagement of companies um, with regard to climate change uh, is being construed as essentially a form of a breach of fiduciary duties. And so company law gets in on the act. And another avenue is uh, human rights. Human rights are um, uh, also increasingly prominent in climate change litigation. Um, and there's basically the, the key arguments there are that uh, irresponsible behavior, failure to respond to climate change, failure to protect us against the, um, the major impacts of climate change constitutes a breach of human rights, either human rights that are enshrined in certain constitutions or that are, for example, in uh, the European Convention on Human Rights. Um, now, my panel here uh, today, and both my panel that is physically uh, present and um, out there in the ether, um, they are very well versed and they have a deep knowledge of every single strand of these aspects of climate litigation. Uh, but what, it, what their uh, strongest area of expertise is in this latter part of the human rights, rights-based climate change litigation. And that's what they're going to be uh, sharing with us. Um, uh, they're, they're going to be sharing with us their expertise on this uh, particular topic this evening. Now, I'm going to introduce them in a second, but I first have a few sort of housekeeping uh, points to raise. First of all, this event is being recorded just so you're aware of it. We have both a physical live uh, panel, um, well, a physical live audience here, which is fantastic and it's wonderful to see you all. Um, but we, we also have uh, an online audience participating in the debate today. Um, and then also last, but by no means least, there is a drinks reception afterwards to which you are all uh, very warmly invited. And you know, the people online are also very warmly invited, but we do appreciate that they might have to be there in spirit rather than with spirits. Um, right. And so now finally, before we uh, enter into uh, the meat of today, I'm going to introduce, I'm going to briefly introduce the panel well, first. We're going to start it on my left. This is Catherine Hyam. Catherine is a, poly, uh, a policy fellow at the Grantham Research Institute. And Catherine is, for example, Catherine is pivotal in uh, supporting also one of the, the, the real, um, you know, one of the real milestones and one of the real kind of landmark outputs of the Grantham Research Institute, which is the, the climate change uh, laws of the world database and also for producing, together with her team, uh, a very regular and extremely well-informed, very up-to-date reports uh, on you know, the state of play and all different kind of aspects of climate change litigation. And I think that's what you will be, you will be presenting, the, the latest iteration there, the newest report uh, in a moment. Um, and then after that, we are going to uh, move to uh, a presentation, uh, a pre-recorded presentation by Professor Christina Roig, uh, who unfortunately had a, a last minute uh, clash coming up. So she can't present uh, live, but she has pre-recorded her presentation. I don't need to say much more about Professor Voigt because she's going to give her own introduction when we play the recording. Uh, but then just to move on my right of me, we have uh, Mark Willers KC uh, and Margarita um, Cornalia, uh, and both are barristers and they are both working, they're really in the thick of dealing with climate litigation uh, on the ground. Mark is instructed in uh, the Clima Signorina case and uh, Margareta is instructed in the Agostini case. And they will, of course, say, you know, it's wonderful to have them here. And I'm sure we will uh, learn uh, an, an amazing wealth of information about what really is going on in these cases. 
They, are, they have all been asked to speak for uh, eight minutes, and I'm going to be in tough path. Past master at this, this very high tech <laughs> bit of kids here that I will be waving in front of them when, uh, when they go over time. Uh, so altogether, we should have about half of the time left for a Q&A afterwards. For the Q&A, obviously, we will be sort of, you know, we will be mixing questions from the audience here in the room with questions uh, that come up online. Um, if I could just ask you uh, for the Q&A to, well, it's always nice if we also know who, who you are. So if you could just briefly tell us who you are when you ask a question. And also, please just, you know, ask a question rather than make a statement. And try to keep it short so that we can fit as many questions in and be as inclusive with the audience as possible. All right, and uh, with that, I've, you know, I've spoken for long enough now, so without further ado, I'm going to turn over to Catherine for the first presentation there. Great, thank you so much, Billy, and thank you all so much for being here today. It's wonderful to see um, such interest in this topic. Um, my role here today is really going to be to um, set the scene a little bit and to talk about what's happening outside of the context of the European Court of Human Rights cases that Mark and Margarita are going to, to talk to us about, um, just to kind of put this in context. To do that, I'm going to draw on a recent report um, that was published at the end of March, uh, where uh, I worked with colleagues, all of whom are in this room, so they can um, point out afterwards whether I made any mistakes. Uh, from the Grantham Research Institute, where we decided to look into um, the sort of a huge um, package of legislation that is currently being discussed at the European level um, on climate change uh, issues, both um, the Fit for 55 package, which has been introduced to implement uh, the new targets prescribed in the European climate law, and also various legislative issues um, uh, and ideas that are going on beyond that, uh, and try and have a bit of crystal ball gazing as to what um, all of these new laws might mean for the courts. Now, there are thousands of pages of um, proposals for European legislation, and I don't intend to walk you through all of them here today. You will be pleased to learn. Instead, I've selected three areas that we talk about in the report that I think are most relevant to the trends in human rights-based climate litigation um, that we'll be touching on elsewhere, and which will hopefully uh, kind of guide um, some of the conversation. The first of those is um, what we call government framework cases. So that's cases that are really focused on uh, enforcing climate targets or increasing the ambition of climate targets. And both the cases that Mark and Margarita are going to talk about would fall within um, that group. The second group of cases I want to touch on is just transition cases, which are often raising human rights concerns about the way in which climate litigation is being, uh, sorry, climate change legislation and policy is being implemented. And then the final the final issue I want to talk about is what new legislation might mean for the trend in business and human rights arguments. Before I jump into those three types of uh, legislation, uh, sorry, those three types of litigation, though, um, I just want to give a very quick overview of the Fit for 55 package, which is a really significant overhaul of European climate law. It consists of eight amendments to the existing body of climate change um, legislation in Europe, and most of them are about increasing the ambition of targets um, uh, in uh, both sort of cross-sectoral issues and in sector-specific ways. There are, however, five new elements that are being introduced into European climate law um, alongside those tightenings of existing targets. Three of them concern uh, provisions around transport, because transport is one of the sectors which has the biggest residual emissions for the EU, so one of the biggest challenges to tackle. The other two, one is a carbon border adjustment mechanism, which is basically being introduced to address concerns that uh, the European emissions trading system, which requires European companies to buy permits uh, to um, account for all of the emissions that they produce, um, is affecting the competitiveness of European companies. Uh, and so the border adjustment mechanism is designed to address that. And the final point is really quite an interesting one. This is the Social Climate Fund, which is being 
introduced to offset the fact that many of these pieces of legislation are likely to have a regressive impact on individuals. So it's been anticipated that there will be increased costs for households and for small businesses being introduced. And the Social Climate Fund, which is um, being funded out of revenues from the emission trading system, uh, is supposed to offset some of those concerns. So moving on to the three types of litigation that I mentioned. Well, the first type, as I've said, is about enforcing or enhancing climate targets. There are more than 80 cases that have now been filed around the world um, in various different jurisdictions, which look at whole of government responses to climate change and whether or not those responses are adequate. Many, although not all of them, are based in human and constitutional rights. And more than 50% of them have so far been filed in Europe including a case, Carvalho and others, that was filed before the Court of Justice of the European Union, which was challenging the earlier 2018 iteration of um, the package of legislation that's now being amended on the basis it was insufficiently ambitious. And we think we may well start seeing new cases arising when the Fit for 55 package is uh, finalized. And these could be of two types. Firstly, we could see cases that are saying, actually, even this new package is insufficiently ambitious. Secondly, we could see cases challenging the way that individual member states have had targets allocated under the new package. And then thirdly, and perhaps most likely, we could see cases that are starting to argue that governments aren't actually doing enough to comply with those regulations. We think the most likely candidates to bring this litigation will be civil society and subnational governments, which is a trend that we've seen already. But we could start to see, and this is a, a real could, also enforcement actions brought by the commission in the coming years if um, states are recalcitrant about implementing the target. The, uh, and I should say as well, that, of course, is the, the type of litigation that is most directly related to what the European Court of Human Rights uh, says in the cases that we're um, uh, about to hear about. Uh, and depending on what judgment the court gives, that will probably shape in quite a significant way the future of that type of uh, litigation. The second type of litigation I wanted to touch on, which is also um, often rights-based, is just transition litigation. So this is a concept that was first identified by uh, Annalisa Savarese and our very own Joanne Setsi here uh, in 2022, which was they started to map out the cases that are challenging the how of climate action um, and trying to understand some of the concerns about procedural and substantive justice that we're seeing arising in the way that climate change policy and legislation is being implemented. As I've already mentioned, we know that the Fit for 55 package is expected to have a regressive impact. And although the Social Climate Fund is supposed to be there to offset that, we anticipate we might see considerable litigation around the way that the funds are being dispersed and also around these social climate plans that member states are going to be required to put together to access those funds. That could be litigation that's looking at the way those social climate plans have been developed, who's been involved in those conversations, or it could be about actually whether or not they're fair in the distribution of the funds. And then the final issue that I wanted to touch on is that although we'll probably focus a lot today on the responsibility of states to protect the human rights of citizens, um, uh, through taking climate action, there is a growing area of litigation that's uh, arising where we're seeing uh, soft law standards about business and human rights being um, uh, really uh, held up in courts uh, across Europe. Uh, and that is likely to continue and to shift in focus uh, as and when we see a new piece of uh, legislation implemented that's currently being debated by the Council and um, the Parliament of the European Union, and that's the Corporate Sustainability Due Diligence Directive. The idea of this is to bring the UN guiding principles on business and human rights and other soft law standards about the human rights responsibilities of business into mandatory hard law. But the way in which that happens is very hotly contested. The uh, original commission proposals included a sort of carved out uh, idea where most human rights would be protected through standards of due diligence requirements and climate transition plans um, would be introduced to address the need to align with 1.5 degrees. And many people in civil society were very concerned about that because uh, really, um, 
seeing this kind of carve out from the rest of the provisions for climate was not what anybody wanted. Many of the concerns have been addressed in the Parliament's latest uh, draft of the legislation, um, but we're yet to see how much of the Parliament's proposal is going to survive the negotiation process. But what I think is really crucial here is that we know that there is a huge amount of attention being paid to um, corporate action on climate change. And whatever this uh, directive ultimately looks like, we're going to see a lot of cases coming out um, as a result. And of course, if the European Court of Human Rights confirms that human, uh, climate change is a human rights issue, as uh, we, we hope and anticipate it will do, then um, that's going to have a big impact on these cases. So just to wrap up then, um, I think it's really crucial as we're thinking about these particular cases and the role of the European Court of Human Rights, not to forget that this isn't happening in a vacuum and that we are seeing huge numbers of other trends and that what legislators are doing in particular is likely to have a really big role in shaping where um, things go next. Thank you. Thank you very much, Catherine. I think now we're going to move to uh, the presentation by Christina. Welcome to all the participants and the organizers of the workshop on climate litigation in Europe, where to go next. And of course, also very warm uh, hello to my uh, distinguished uh, uh, co-panelists. My name is Christina Burke, I'm a professor of law at the University of Oslo in Norway, and the chair of the IUCN World Commission on Environmental Law and the future of the Affairs Agreement Implementation and Compliance Committee. And I will be speaking about the importance of the uh, cases at the kind of cases at the European Court on human rights in the context of international climate litigation. As you all know, uh, climate litigation has now reached the level of supranational and international courts, and we are looking at an unprecedented number of four requests. For advisory opinions from uh, international courts, the International Court of Justice, the International Tribunal of Obviously, the Inter American Court on Human Rights, and the African Court on Human Rights and People's Rights. And many cases are currently scheduled at the European Court of Human Rights on climate change. Two of them had already their hearings, and another one will be heard in September. We also know that the UN treaty bodies have been very active in hearing complaints on climate change and rendering their views. And I can also report that as of very recently, the Paris Agreement Implementation and Compliance Committee has um, issued or has initiated its first two considerations of issues of no compliance. And the fascinating thing is that all of this currently happens pretty much at the same time much as we speak, which raises a number of challenges, which I will briefly discuss here. One uh, challenge or one interesting aspect is, of course, the one of um, sequency, uh, which of these international courts, depending on the advisory opinions, will act first, and how will the others relate to the first advisory opinion uh, rendered. Also, how will other international and regional human rights courts uh, relate to the contentious cases um, decided by the European Court of Human Rights, although the other uh, courts are involved in advisory opinions, which, as you know, are not legally binding. But, of course, courts and judges who uh, are common people behind it, they, they know each other, they listen to each other, and there will, of course, be a certain sequence coming up that will also determine what other courts will uh, say and then will decide uh, their cases or how that will inf inform their advisory opinions. The second issue, the first one was sequence, the second one is the issue of consistency. I think we are looking at a really fascinating uh, of, of international uh, courts involved in these um, uh, opinions and contentious cases. But if you peel down everything down to the very core of the legal issues at stake, 
we will see that at the very heart of the issues at the European Court of Human Rights as well, ICLOS and the ICJ, is the issue of what exactly are uh, states required to do in uh, terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions and re re enhancing the rules. And that will be relevant either as part of the positive obligations of states under Article 2 and 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights, for example, in order to protect the rights of those Swiss elderly, elderly ladies or Mr. Kavim, uh, or the Portuguese youth and children, at the very core will be the question, what are states required to do in terms of addressing climate change? It will also be at the core of a question at ITLOS, what are states to do in order to protect and preserve the marine environment, and to pre prevent, reduce, and control pollution uh, of the marine environment under Articles 192 and 194 of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, respectively, as part of their due diligence obligations. And it will be relevant in the context of the due diligence obligation under the customary norm of uh, prohibition of significant transboundary harm and harm to areas beyond international jurisdiction. So this will come up in all these different uh, cases and all these different scenarios, and it will be very important that those different courts come to a consistent conclusion and do not contradict uh, each other. And one core question in this regard will be uh, the question of how to draw upon and relate to the Paris Agreement in the context of interpreting um, other international law or uh, interpreting uh, cutting international law. Here, as part, of course, of the applicable law that depends on the rules of procedure in other international courts or as relevant in an international standard of care when it comes to determining the religion's uh, standard or in the course of interpretation in particular, um, systemic interpretation in line with Article 31. We see of uh, the Vienna Convention on the Law of the Treaties when it comes to taking into account any um, uh, rules of international law uh, applicable in relation between the parties. And the second question, of course, is what would the courts do if they were to draw upon the Paris Agreement? What parts of the Paris Agreement? would they draw in and rely on and use in the context of interpretation of other international law? Would it just be the temperature goal? I hope not, because the Paris Agreement has much more to offer than Article 2. But even if it were the temperature goal to hold warming well below uh, 2 degrees and take measures to 1.5 degrees, it would be important to draw in then also Article 4. Paragraph one and the global goals of climate neutrality, um, of balancing of emissions and renewables uh, in the second half of this century, which would have to be interpreted in light of the most recent IPCC report. And we all know that the synthesis report of the sixth assessment report was very clear that this would mean um, reaching global net zero emissions by 2050 and global net negative emissions all the way thereafter until the end of the century. And what would be the standard of care that these courts would apply if they were to rely on the Paris Agreement? And here I think it is important to remember that the Paris Agreement itself contains a due diligence standard, which is built into the agreement um, where in light of the temperature goal, parties need to undertake their best efforts or uh, do as well as they can. And this lies in the request to parties that the indices will reflect the highest possible ambition. And this is a quality standard of care. This could be very become very important in the context of those currently pending advisory requests and contentious cases. I think rather than expecting that the courts would be willing to determine a uh, quantified fair share 
it may be much more uh, appropriate to request or expect of the court to uh, um, adjudicate on a qualified standard of care in line with due diligence and best efforts as it is prescribed in the Paris Agreement itself. I think courts would feel much more comfortable to request uh, of states to uh, deploy their, their best efforts. As I said, this is required under the Paris Agreement and courts do not have to make that up, but can rely solely on, on what uh, Article 4, Paragraph 3 of the agreement uh, already requires states to do. Um, I think courts will most likely not go above and beyond the Paris Agreement as reflecting a global consensus on what states are required to do. But understanding the agreement going to its, into its details and uh, drawing upon its dynamic and flexible uh, character also in light of most up-to-date science will be a very important aspect both in the proceedings or uh, in front of the European Court of Human Rights as well as all the other international courts that are currently engaged in climate issues. And with that, thank you very much for your attention. All right, thank you. That went off without a hitch. That was great. Um, and so we're now going to turn to um, <laughs> to uh, inputs from legal practice at the goal phase. Um, and we we'll first turn to Mark Withers. Thank you very much, Vera, and um, for inviting me to participate in this discussion. I'm delighted to be here tonight. Um, in fact, I'm here with both my wonderful colleagues from the legal team. I can see Richard Harvey and Jessica Seymour Casey uh, sitting at the other end of the room. Um, they, uh, with me and other members of the team, uh, represented the Syrian on it, and these with female women uh, before the European Court of Human Rights and the what was in fact scheduled as the uh, first ever climate change case to be heard by the courts about a month ago now. And um, it's one of uh, three cases that have been listed this year uh, before the European Court of Human Rights. Another one was the case RM against France, which was heard in the afternoon after the case that uh, we put before the courts being heard in the morning. And the third case was the case to our say, I've seen her case, and I'm not going to steal Marguerite Thunder because she's going to tell you all about that case. Um, before the hearing, uh, there was also an awful lot of uh, written material put before the court, and the Swift lawyers that we were working with um, at the hearing had done most of the work in that regard. And in fact, you can see uh, their efforts on the Clean of Senior Williams uh, website. Uh, it's all there for you to look at if you wish to do so. In essence, the applicants, and they included an association, the Association of Senior Swiss Women, um, which numbered over 2,000 members together with uh, four individual uh, elderly SWIFT women, argued that the SWIFT government had failed to tackle climate change by failing to adopt the necessary short-term and long-term greenhouse gas emission reduction targets, and that that therefore breached their rights protected by Article 2 and 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights. And, and not only that, that the SWIFT courts, when dealing with their complaints, uh, failed to determine it and provide them with a remedy, thereby breaching Article 6 and 13 of the uh, Convention. In response, the Swiss state argued that the applicants were just trying to circumvent the Paris Agreement by seeking to construct um, an international judicial review of its climate uh, measures, and that the court should not admit oh, and determine the complaint because it would involve itself taking on the role of um, some, sort of, some sort of supreme international environmental court. The Swiss government also argued that they should be given a, a very wide margin of appreciation um, when determining how to tackle climate change and what targets to affect itself. There were a large number of interventions uh, by member states uh, who were really all on the side of the uh, Swiss government. International uh, non-governmental organizations, universities, legal experts on international environmental law, law including Christina Voigt, um, as well as from scientific experts. In the event, the court uh, allowed two of them, the Republic of Ireland and the government, 
uh, of the public of Ireland and also the European network of national human rights institutions, um, the ability to make oral submissions and make it just that. A few weeks before the hearing, the court um, gave us some more questions to answer and asked that we did that orally. And one of those um, was particularly pertinent, um, but given the case we were advancing. And that was this. Has the Swiss government adopted an overall national carbon budget for the period up to 2050? And if so, what basis has the budget been calculated upon? Our point, point being that there was no such uh, overall national carbon budget and no evidence that the uh, Swiss state had ever done any sort of proper analysis or assessment of what its fair share should be. On the morning of the hearing, the leader, who it sounds is uh, the normal procedure, um, went up to the judge's chamber, the president of the court's chamber, uh, Judge uh, Schiffer O'Leary, and um, we were there presented with, would you believe, a, a, a tranche of documents for the first time that hadn't been disclosed to us before. Um, one of which was in German, not even the language of the court, an official language of the court. And the Swiss government's lawyers there explained that those documents uh, were designed to answer the, one, of the, one of the questions, the key uh, question that was asked us to address it uh, orally upon, that being, had there been any assessment of what the budget should be uh, and, and what was the basis for it? And this is, all, this is the kind of shenanigans that go on in the lower court sort of thing that we see um, perhaps in the magistrate's court or in the council court occasionally in the high court, uh, but rarely in the Court of Appeal uh, and, and, and hardly ever in the Supreme Court, let alone the European Court of Human Rights. And uh, you know, designed as it was to perhaps ambush us to railroad the proceedings, clearly we were all there. Hundreds of people were in the courtroom. We couldn't ask for an adjournment uh, in order to go and assess um, what had been submitted, uh, get it translated and respond. And um, uh, the president didn't ask us uh, uh, to respond at that point in time either. She uh, understood the position straight away and gave us, um, in, in the end, about a month in order to address those points that had been made. When we went through that material, when the Swiss lawyers in particular went through it, we found that some of it was outdated. It was dated back to 2012. None of it had been disclosed before. And in fact, some of it actually contradicted the case that the Swiss government were putting before the so in the end, perhaps it was worthwhile that we had that opportunity uh, to do more than just simply say it should be dismissed on the basis of it's too late to admit it. In court, the Swiss government's lawyers made the same case that they'd made on paper. Um, and then uh, we had the opportunity to respond. And my colleague, uh, Jessica, who sits opposite me, uh, introduced the applicant's case by making the point that the world is faced with an existential threat to which we must respond with action. She said, we're in this defeatism, neither is an option. Every country, institution, and policymaker must meet their responsibility to, all, to do all that is necessary to mitigate the impending harm. We then addressed the uh, Article 6 and Article 13 case, uh, and uh, having done so, I won't get taken into the detail of that, um, we addressed the thorny issue of victim status. We explained that the applicants including the uh, members of the uh, SWIFT uh, Senior uh, uh, Women's Association, were already suffering from the effects of climate change. As only women, the excessive and sustained high temperatures uh, of increasing frequency and severe heat waves pose, we said, an extremely serious threat, not just to their health and well-being, but to their lives. And we referred to courts of evidence, which showed that there was a disproportionate number of elderly women are dying uh, over the last 20 years during the heat waves that Switzerland had suffered. One of the applicants, as I've said, is, was the Association of Swiss Senior Women. And um, we argued, uh, contrary to what the states were saying, that um, their case should be admitted. It wasn't an actio popularis. And we countered the arguments that put forward by the states by explaining that the association was in effect no more than a uh, group of individuals, each one of whom was directly affected, and each one of whom who could have, in fact, made an application, but did the court really need 2,000 applications? And perhaps it would be better to hear from the association uh, as a representative of those women. We, we pointed to and relied upon the decision of the Dutch Supreme Court in the Uganda case and, and, and the findings that it had made 
Uh, uh, and argued that the court should follow that court's lead and hold that Switzerland was under a positive obligation uh, to take the necessary steps to guarantee effective protection for the applicants' lives, health, and well being. Um, we, we made the point that it, when one looks at the evidence, um, and we relied upon the climate action tracker and uh, reports uh, from um, Professor Rajamani and others, um, it was quite clear that Switzerland's uh, had not done what was necessary uh, in terms of adopting a legislative and administrative framework to achieve uh, the objective of preventing global temperature increases of more than 1.5 degrees above the pre-industrial levels. Um, we made the point again, um, it, uh, and, and really was the answer to the, 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 the court's primary question, that the split had not carried out any studies or due diligence the point that was being made by Christina in her presentation in relation to the 1.5 degree limit identified by the IPCC. And um, we also described the fact that the Swiss government was uh, using up uh, excessive carbon and uh, an excessive proportion of, its, of the global carbon budget, the remaining global carbon budget, as carbon theft. Uh, we identified exactly what we suggested the uh, Swiss government should be doing in terms of meeting goals uh, at, uh, up to 2030 and 2050, and uh, concluded by saying that if a country is rich and technologically advanced, as uh, Switzerland cannot do its fair share, indeed does not even take the trouble to assess what its fair share should be, what hope is there that other countries would step up to the challenge we face? And there were then, I, I should say, questions from the court, a number of questions. Uh, there were 17 judges, uh, and many of them asked us questions. We were sent out for 30 minutes. Uh, Jessica uh, uh, answered all those questions uh, uh, brilliantly uh, when we came back into court, and then it was over, and judgment has been reserved. Um, I can tell you more about what happened after the hearing. We had a great event with all the uh, inspirational uh, clients we represented, a very moving event, uh, but I may not have time to do just that. Well, thank you very much. Absolutely fascinating. And Margarita, um, is that similar to your experience in the Agostino case, or were there different aspects that you were denying? Well, the main difference is that we still haven't had a hearing. So. <laughs> um, um, but again, thank you. Thank you very much for having me and asking me to say a few words about the YJ. I was asked to speak briefly about the issues in the Agostino case and to then zoom into the Article 13 of discrimination arguments. And that's, I realized, quite a big task. Um, so uh, what I hope to do is to first give you a broad overview of the case, but focusing on what I think are three really important and key arguments involved in it. And then um, I will then try to zoom into Article 14 and then I'm happy to answer questions uh, that arise from that. Um, so starting with the overview of legal arguments. So the starting point for the claim is, is really the science of climate change as set out into in the IPCC report, which is now widely accepted and recognized by courts uh, and states and, and, and institutions, the applicants rely on the IPCC's findings to build three key submissions. Now, the first is that climate change is indisputably a man-made phenomenon, such that its inception and continuation are caused by human behavior. Climate change is already having a number of physical impacts that are likely to increase and worsen over time on current trajectories. Second, what is causing those impacts is the failure of states to act compatibly with the 1.5 long-term temperature goal set out by the IPCC. The applicants argue that these physical impacts combined with the respondent state's failure to act in line with the 1.5 goal are and will continue to affect ever more severely their human rights, particularly by reason of their young age. The third broad argument that the applicants make is a predominantly legal one, and it is, and it's namely that the European Court of Human Rights is needed to safeguard, safeguard the applicant rights. And that is because domestic courts grappling with climate cases have not ruled in a manner which is consistent with keeping global temperatures aligned with 1.5, and thus in a manner capable of safeguarding the applicant's rights. Turning to each, to each of those, so the first is physical impacts. I had dotted down sections of the IPCC and the applicant's evidence around 
how these impacts of climate change are impacting them, uh, but I don't have time to read those out. And so I won't say much about physical impacts. The short story is that the applicants rely predominantly uh, on the impacts of extreme heat and wildfires on their health, both physical and mental health, and on their well-being. So they, they describe impacts going from uh, inability to spend time outdoors, uh, impacts on sleeping, impacts on uh, asthma, to very severe traumatic impacts tied to experiencing wildfires close to them. Um, and they also rely on the scientific evidence that says that absence decisive uh, action, these impacts risk getting much, much worse over time, and importantly, during the course of the applicant's lifetime. Now, that's the first key basis of the applicant's argument, so the impacts of climate change. The second focuses on what states are or aren't doing about this. What the applicants argue is that the reason why uh, they are suffering impacts is because states are failing to regulate and limit emissions compatibly with a global 1.5 temperature goal. They therefore argue that there's a duty upon states to regulate and limit emissions compatibly with 1.5 in order to safeguard their human rights. The applicants then focus on a number of acts and emissions, four in particular, that the respondent states are responsible for, which they say are inconsistent with the 1.5 global goal, and therefore amount to different aspects of a breach of human rights. The first of these is permitting the release of greenhouse gases within the state's national territories and offshore areas. The second is permitting the extraction of fossil fuels within their territory. The third is permitting the import of goods, the production of which involves release of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And finally, the fourth is, fourth is permitting entities within their jurisdiction to contribute to the release of these gases overseas through the extract, extraction of fossil fuels or by financing some su such extraction. Now, the, argue, the applicants argue that these acts and emissions have led to the climate change impacts they are suffering now. And they also argue that these acts and emissions are continuing to date. They rely on evidence that Mark has already cited the Climate Action Tracker, the UNEP Emissions Gap Report, which shows that we're so far off track, uh, the 1.5 uh, pathways aligned with the 1.5 goal. And so the applicants say that as a result of that, uh, of these acts and emissions, the impacts that the applicants are experiencing today are most likely to continue getting worse and worse, uh, and so cause increasingly severe violations of their human rights. Finally, the third and key argument that the applicants make is that the European Court of Human Rights must intervene to protect their rights. And this argument is based on the contention that there are no effective domestic remedies. And I'd like to give you two different examples to make this point. The first is, as a, is a, a, of a domestic judgment uh, that looks at the relevance of the Paris Agreement to uh, human rights. And the second is uh, of two domestic judgments that look at the relevance of the way in which states set emissions reduction targets to human rights obligations. So the first is Plan B Earth and Prime Minister, uh, and the Prime Minister and others, and that's C, uh, the reference in the case of CA 2021-003448. In that case, Lord Justice Singh refused permission to appeal to the Court of Appeal. And one of the fundamental reasons why he did that is in paragraph five of his judgment. And what he says is this, he says, the fundamental difficulty which the claimants face is that there is no authority from the European Court of Human Rights on which they can rely citing the Paris Agreement as being relevant to the interpretation of articles two and eight of the ECHR. So here we have an example of a domestic judgment where um, the court refuses permission to appeal, appeal specifically because there's no European Court of Human Rights Authority that says that the Paris, Paris Agreement is relevant. The second set of examples that I just wanted to look at are examples where courts have probably accepted um, that the Paris Agreement and the IPCC is relevant to the application of human rights law, um, but where they've um, allowed the state to set emissions reduction targets that are basically self-interested. And the Rigenda decision, which is hailed as a positive decision on climate, and certainly is because there's an acceptance of the relevance of climate change under the Paris Agreement to human rights, is an example of this. Because what happened here is that the Dutch state had, adopt, had adopted an emissions reduction target, which was at the very low lower end of the fair share range from the IPCC's fourth assessment report. 
um, which required uh, emissions reductions between 25 and 40 percent below 1990 levels by 2020. And the Dutch Supreme Court held that the necessity for judicial deference to the political organs of the state in this area meant that it could do no more than adopt the lowest end of the figure in this range, that is the 25% figure, as a measure of compliance. And the German Federal Constitutional Court did something similar in Neubayer when it accepted uh, that Germany could set uh, emissions reductions targets on an equal per capita measure. Now, if every state simply chose to pursue emissions reductions consistent with the less stringent end of their fair share ranges, it's just not possible to achieve a global long-term temperature goals of 1.5 degrees. And this reflects the fact recognized by working with group three of the IPCC that effective mitigation of climate change will not be achieved if each country acts independently in its own interest. So that's why the applicants in Duarte asked the court to intervene and intervene quite decisively on the issue of emissions reductions targets, because otherwise there's a real risk that the 1.5 long-term temperature goal will simply be compromised at global level and that human rights violations will continue and become uh, more severe. Now, I don't think I have too much time left, but very, very briefly on questions. Yeah, just on Article 13, should I leave that for questions, maybe? Um, um, we could, yes, if, if that's okay with you. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Very okay. happy Sorry, I've run out of time. <laughs> we have such a big <laughs> audience here tonight, so we do want to uh, take the opportunity. Thank you absolutely. very much. Uh, thank you very much for your willingness to do that, because I'm sure everyone has lots of questions. So with that, we're going to um, open up to questions. So I'm going to take uh, three questions from the live audience, and then uh, maybe we'll have look at questions uh, that are asked online um so let's start okay we've got uh, some hands up already so we'll start over there i don't know do we actually need a roving mic or or maybe because it's being recorded right. yes yes okay um, sorry, do you have yes. a... so i'll take three questions and one then we'll directly to Pam. Right. My name is Shah. My question is, um, I come from the global south, from India. My roots are in Africa as well. So I'm coming from the indigenous regions. And I've heard for the last 20 minutes or so, um, the three speakers or four. My question is in all these conferences is, and you can correct me if I've missed anything out, is in these legal talks, I'm not hearing much about where is the Indian High Court or the Chinese High Court or the African High Court, because our countries and continents, we sit on most of the resources that you require for these solar panels, for these green solutions. And I'm just wondering where are we involved in the conversation on these resources? Because India is, obviously valued because it's under the English legal system. So it'd be very highly valued as a court system. And then you've got the Chinese, you've got the African, you've got some Asian systems as well. Um, and in terms of human rights, 2019 was when the United Nations took a look at Excuse me, I understand, but yeah. remember we did say questions, not speeches. Yeah. Sorry, my question is, where is the Global South, where 99% of the resources are held? Where are we included in the conversation? Because if we were, I think you'd have a much different broader picture. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Um, hello, uh, my name is Stuart McGahey from King Paul's John Law School. Uh, thank you for wonderful uh, talks and uh, well done on pursuing these cases. Um, I'm also uh, part of a case which is suing the UK's biggest pension fund and derivative claim uh, to make them divest fossil fuel, that's the university superannuation scheme, um, as fast as possible. Um, and it's personal liability for the directors. And um, uh, so, so looking at the financial aspect, the argument is that fossil fuels pose a risk of significant financial detriment. Uh, and it's got to be interpreted in line with the right to life. Fossil fuels are stranded assets. Um, so that means that they've gone to their best now. Uh, the question is, uh, Christina Voigt uh, suggested uh, that 
um, the net zero by 2050 in the Paris Agreement was not only something that we had to comply with, it's also a, a sort of um, uh, maximum. Uh, so, so she said, uh, I, I don't know if you picked up on that, she said that uh, there shouldn't be any less done, uh, or sorry, sorry, any, any more done than uh, net zero by 2050, uh, which is kind of a problem if you think that your claimants uh, are suffering harm uh, and they're suffering a violation of their right to life, uh, and therefore you want the harm to stop now. It wouldn't be to stop it by 2050, it would be to protect the right to life now. And I'm just wondering, uh, uh, and, and perhaps I could add this, the Paris Agreement could be seen as, you know, get to net zeros, keep below two degrees or 1.5 degree ambition. It could also be seen as a license for the fossil fuel companies to keep polluting up to two degrees of climate damage or up to 1.5 degrees. So, so my question is, do, do your submissions uh, also encourage courts to go faster and perhaps as fast as technology allows. Thank you. And then we'll have one final one from the floor if there is one to ask. Or... Ah, okay, great. Thanks. Hi, I'm Sonam. I'm an uh, academic in environmental law. Uh, my question is for Margarita um, and about the third ground that you discussed in relation to the Duarte case, which I think is fascinating because you get into questions then of the extent to which the European Court is willing to engage in a dialogue with domestic courts on quite a big scale. And I wonder if you've encountered or in, in your work in the lead up to the hearing, how you've worked around what could potentially be a really sticky or challenging issue for the, for the courts to have a big. Thank you very much. So we'll, we'll kick off with those questions. And if I can just direct, um, maybe um, it, Catherine and, and maybe Joanna, you wanna come in as well and just give a little bit of information of what is happening whether and how we're looking at involving the global south in the discussion. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that is a really important um, point to raise. I suppose with this event, we um, were specifically interested in looking at um, what's happening in the European context because there is a lot happening in the European Court of Human Rights. Um, it's something that has generated a lot of interest. But in the broader work that we do at the Grantham Research Institute and here at LSE, we are looking extensively at the work that's being done uh, by courts in the global south. And there are some amazing and really groundbreaking judgments that have come out of courts in the global south in recent years. One of the first cases to to, um, discuss human rights implications of climate change came from the Supreme, uh, actually it was the High Court at the time, uh, the judge has now moved to the Supreme Court. But the High Court of Pakistan was in a case um, of Asghar Ligari um, uh, and the state of Pakistan. And it was a case that was brought by um, a, a guy who owns a farm, he also had a law degree, uh, and he was arguing that although Pakistan had a uh, adaptation plan, a national plan that said it should be responding to the impacts of climate change, uh, it had um, failed to implement that plan. And the, the judge gave this really scathing judgment, one that has been cited in courts around the world um, ever since. Uh, and, and so it's really significant, I think, in the, the story that we're telling here um, uh, about what's happening um, kind of here in Europe. We're also seeing a lot of pr uh, progress and really interesting, innovative legal arguments being made in countries in Latin America at the moment, many of them related to the right to a healthy environment uh, and the obligations that states have under domestic constitutions. So the constitutions that people in those countries have agreed to for themselves rather than international human rights standards um, that uh, and those cases, we're seeing some, some good judgments about the need to protect the right to a healthy environment uh, and the need for more action, and in particular for the protection of um, resources um, uh, and, and forests and, and natural resources in those countries. Um, and I think that the final point um, that I'd make goes back to the, that group of cases I was talking about, which are uh, just transition cases. And again, here, this is an area where we are really seeing leadership and innovation from communities in the global south. Many of the first cases that we um, documented that involve these questions about how climate action is happening and the justice of the way in which decision making is going on are cases from global south countries um, there was a really wonderful case um, from the supreme court of chile uh, where a group of workers had challenged an energy plan uh, an energy transition plan that had been developed with input from the energy companies but not 
from any of the um, workers or the unions and went all the way to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court said you absolutely should be considering workers and you need to redo this plan with their involvement because you know this affects them and their livelihoods in every way so um, yeah with this event we were really um, sort of focusing on this this one part of the picture but there is actually a really a wealth of information out there about what's happening in the global south as well that's crucial to think about does that in, because in the global south we are of course we're talking about fossil fuels but in northeast states of india and congo we are now challenging the mining companies who are mining not the fossil fuels, but all the 20, 30 minerals you need for renewables in Congo. So when you've got 200,000 people in a mine, I'm like, okay, well, where is this green transition taking us? It's, yeah. it's taking us into a hell well, I mean, that is a really crucial issue. And we are starting to see these cases coming up on lithium mining, on cobalt mining. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, like maybe another maybe another event that we should hold just on <laughs> just on these just transition cases. Thank you, I think, yes. Thank you, I think Mark, Mark, you would also like to? Yeah, I mean, I, I was just going to say that there, there obviously are many, many cases out there that we could refer you to, but one of them involves a claim brought against a German company, RWE, uh, by a Peruvian farmer. He's bringing that case in Germany, uh, Rhoda for and his um, is, is acting for him in that case and, and, and arguing that he should be entitled to compensation from RWE for the uh, impact of climate change on his local environment, indeed his, his, his farm and his ability to live um, close to what is a melting glacier. And so that's an innovative case and uh, no doubt there'll be more of those kind of cases. And then there are cases brought uh, against states like the UK, for example, for funding uh, fossil fuel development, indeed, Jessica uh, Seymour um, it, it, it is currently taking a case, hopefully, to the Supreme to Court onto that issue where the UK is, is putting funds into uh, fossil fuel production in the global south. And so it's good to tackle the, you know, go for the money, as it were, um, in order to ensure that these uh, uh, this kind of production doesn't take place. But then there has to be some alternative provided for the uh, for, for, for those that live in uh, that state and others. And then there are brilliant cases like the Ligari case, but also the uh, case brought by uh, an organisation called Future Generations in Colombia. Uh, they took the case all the way to the Supreme Court, arguing that um, the state should uh, protect the Amazon region in, in Colombia. And they succeeded. And the uh, the court, in fact, ordered that there should be a plan for the uh, regeneration of the Amazon uh, region in that country, um, to which the future generation uh, uh, association should be uh, um, party. And so they were, uh, in effect, given the remedy of, of helping to redesign or, uh, or, or replan how that uh, part of the Amazon should be uh, regenerated. So there's a, you know, there's no doubt we could have a we could have a couple of days, I think, going through um, some of the work being done, brilliant work being done by colleagues in the global south, and perhaps you know that's something we should be doing. Thank you very much, um, All right, let's move on to the second question. Yes, I mean, uh, you pointed out well, you know, international law, like the Paris Agreement, is a part of international law, and because of that, of course, it's a, you know a creature of compromise rather than of unbridled ambition, right? So uh, is that going to, is that going to, the, are the goals in the Paris Agreement going to function as a ceiling in these kind of um, human rights, in, in human rights litigation? Or is there scope for human rights litigation to actually sort of burst through that ceiling to go beyond that ceiling? I don't know who wants to Yes, I'm happy to have the, um, the, the first stab at answering that question. Yeah, I, I heard that too from Chris, Christine. I'm not sure she was necessarily saying that um, we should all be aiming, as it were, um, at, at meeting the Paris Agreement and going no further. But there are certainly um, cases that are being brought where um, uh, the argument is being put, and it's based upon science, that actually the, the, the Paris Agreement's um, uh, 1.5 degree um, limit, if we call it a limit as opposed to a target, and that's the way we put it in the in the Swiss case, it, it, it is too high. And really, we should be looking at maybe one degree. Um, the, the OCT, our children's, yeah, or zero. 
our children's trust case um, is very much put on the basis that 350 parts per million is the, is the maximum. And that's about one, one degree, as I understand it, but I might have got my fingers and facts wrong. Um, and so, um, because any, any, any degree of uh, temperature rise has implications and, 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 and is dangerous for any number of people, predominantly uh, has to be fed in the global south. Uh, in areas which are already susceptible to flooding and heat waves and, and droughts and so forth. Um, and, and so any degree uh, of rise or any partial degree of rise um, exacerbates the uh, situation. So I, I think that we should definitely be thinking in terms of um, uh, exceeding the, the Paris Agreement, which after all was a political construct. Uh, and and we know that the evidence, the scientific evidence, is changing all the time. And and you know and and indeed the, the targets or the limits are being um, up down as a consequence of the ever uh, increasing amount of scientific evidence that we have. The other thing that I'm concerned about is that the, the governments are um, uh, tending, uh, perhaps wholesale these days, to rely upon um, silver bullets, uh, kind of negative emission technology. And I'm afraid that doesn't certainly doesn't watch with me. It shouldn't watch with the courts um, because um, you, you know if we can if we can bring in negative emission technology, carbon capture and storage, whatever it may be, whatever form it may be in the future, that's fantastic. But we don't have it at the moment. We haven't got it at scale, um, and and so it should be an add-on as opposed to um, you know the silver bullets, the the knight in silver in shining armor, as it were. Why do you want a white charger? We should not go down that route. Um, and, and I'm very concerned about that being the, 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 the as it were, the big pro quo or the argument that governments um, <laughs> rely upon whenever they say, oh, it's just too difficult to have emissions right now. Don't worry, because the problem will be that, 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 that it will be the children, those that uh, Margarita are representing, who will have to clean up the mess or turn off the lights and, and sit in the dark and try and avoid the heat. Right, thank you. And if we, as you mentioned, Margaret, I think I'm going to Sunan's question about the third ground. And maybe also, I was interested Sorry. in something about Article 14. Can you hear a little bit more answer. about it? And it's high, I mean, I, I think sort of the two questions somewhat tie into each other because in terms of sort of asking for immediate action, a, a big part of the argument that is made in, in Duarte is that um, there's a continuum of, of, of impacts of climate change that are due to a continuum of violations. So acid emissions by states that have happened in the past are continuing to happen today as states set inadequate targets and then fail to comply with those targets. And then are likely to continue at least on current trajectories in the future. And as a result, there's a continuum of impacts and violations. Uh, and as I was saying, the, 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 the argument that, that the applicants put forward, and this goes to the uh, issue of standard setting is that in the context of uncertainty, which which exists in the in the context of climate change, um, the effectiveness principle, as well as the no harm and precautionary principles in international law, require require any any ambiguity surrounding how to define a state's share to be resolved in favor in favor of the applicants. And so, what the applicants say is, we need. Um, the only way in which, realistically, there can be a, a, a proper adequate protection of human rights today, but also in the future, is if states today uh, adopt more stringent fair share uh, measures. Uh, and so essentially, it, it looks at resolving the ambiguity around fair share in favour of the applicants involves defining the obligation to mitigate as requiring states to pursue emissions reductions in line with more stringent uh, measures of their fair share. Uh, and the applicants rely quite heavily on the climate act and action trackers fair share methodology, uh, because what they look at is if you look at the le level of ambition that states have, sh have set uh, today, um, all of the respondent states' mitigation efforts are ultimately consistent with three degrees in, uh, of warming. So we say to avoid that happening in future, you need to act now and set more stringent uh, targets now. Um, and just briefly on, on, on Article 14, sort of tying into what Mark was saying about the burden in emissions reductions today and the burden in emissions reductions tomorrow, the failure to adopt more stringent uh, measures today, more stringent targets today, means that we're basically just kicking the burden down the line and, and leaving the younger generations to deal with it. 
Uh, and so that's one of the aspects of the Article 14 argument. The other, the other aspect is that young people are generally more vulnerable because they are at early stages of psychological and cognitive development. So the impacts that are being suffered today are being suffered more severely, yeah? even leaving aside the, the issue of future risks uh, and future impacts increasing and becoming more severe. Today, the impacts that, 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 that the young people and children applicants are facing are already more severe by reason of their young age. Um, and, and we rely in particular on expert evidence of mental health impacts as well in, in that respect. So thank you. Have, thank you so very much for that. Um, I, I saw on Q&A that we have uh, 10 notifications there. So We'll go to that in just a sec. I just wanted to add one little thing about uh, the whole Paris Agreement as a ceiling issue. I do think, well, I think that when Christina was talking about that, she was talking from the perspective of the Compliance Committee of the, uh, because she is also uh, on the Compliance Committee of the Paris Agreement. And from that perspective, you can see how it's difficult to challenge a, a party with not, not complying with the Paris Agreement when they're actually meeting the targets of the Paris Agreement. So within that context, it would be hard to expect, it would be difficult to expect a kind of, you know, an, an overperformance. Uh, but there is, of course, there's a broader risk there that the, the validation of that kind of performance then is taken as the right standard also outside the context of complying with the Paris Agreement. And that complying with the Paris Agreement is being equated to being on track to a sustainable future, which is obviously, which is questionable. Um, all right, shall we, uh, are there a few questions that we can take from the um, online community? Yes, um, so we have three that uh, to sort of align with the in-person audience. Um, so our first question is from Janine Hasler in Zurich. And she would be interested to know if our panelists see a ripple effect of the Klima Signorinen case on climate change litigation cases against communities. Uh huh. All right. And then our second question is from uh, Valerie. And she is wondering uh, if any of our panelists foresee that the pattern followed so far by climate litigation will be followed by biodiversity related litigation and if there would be any significant differences between climate and biodiversity litigation. Mm -hmm. And then our final question um, is from uh, Remina Alexeva uh, from Bulgaria. And uh, her question is, what control and monitoring mechanisms do you think should be in place for climate litigation to be more effective? Oh, right. Those are all fantastic questions. Our online community is on fire tonight. Um, right. Uh, who would like to tackle the ripple effect? Margaret? Yeah. Well, it's on, it's on the Swiss case in particular, so perhaps I'll leave it to Mark. I, I think the question was to be a clear ripple effect, and, and so will, will that have an impact on cases against companies? But is that right? Yeah. yeah. I, I think there will be a ripple effect. Um, uh, Probably a general ripple effect, so it will have an impact on cases uh, that might be brought against companies, against um, directors, for example. Um, Ewan was talking about such a case. Um, and we know that Planet Earth are involved in, a, I think, bringing litigation against the board of directors um, of a particular company um, at this point in time. So there are, there are a number of those cases brewing, as it were. And um, one of the one of the points about the Swiss senior women's case was that it was really important that we um, created a campaign around the case in order to ensure that um, uh, you know the, the widest possible uh, um, uh, number of people got to hear about what the case uh, was uh, about and, and the arguments that were being put forward by the. Uh, elder women, um, what impacts climate change is having upon them, and how you can tackle those impacts at um, the grassroots level, whether it be in the council chamber or at the local county court, or, or influencing politicians, perhaps, you know, maybe at the elections or in Switzerland, for example, um, in, in the course of a referendum. And also, then, if, if, if in the event that the political arguments fail, um, cases can be brought before the domestic courts and then ultimately uh, up to the European Court of Human Rights. So it's it, you know, galvanizing um, not just the Swiss population, but also the population of all those across Europe and indeed further afield 
um, uh, into the global south. All those um, uh, uh, who are able to understand you know, simple but um, effective arguments put forward on behalf of the, um, the applicants in that case. Um, we're bound to have a, a bill for the ripple effect. And you know, we can see that because there are a, a, a considerable number of cases now um, that are uh, before the European Court of Human Rights. We have the Agostino case coming up soon, which you know, broadens the scope of the argument um, uh, and covers 33 member states. And the louder the message and the, and the, and the stronger the message uh, going out to um, the population of Europe and beyond, um, that we need to tackle climate change urgently, um, the better. And the more likely it is that cases will be brought uh, not just against states, not just against fossil fuel companies, uh, but against their directors too. Um, I, I, because if we if we uh, tackle the directors and make them realise that they can't get away with what they've been doing for years, then I think we will uh, uh, make significant inroads and hopefully get closer to meeting at the very least the Paris Agreement um, attached targets. I have a quick point on this. Um, just because um, one of the um, breaches that the applicants rely on in Duarte is um, a state, uh, so, so the states permitting entities within their jurisdiction to contribute to the release of greenhouse gases overseas. So this one directly, uh, obviously directly affects corporates in some sense because um, if the case does go in our favour, then that influences the regulatory obligations of states in, in governing corporates that are uh, entities of, of that state. So that's, I think, a very direct possible ripple effect that these cases might have. I think there's a second less direct effect, uh, which is in the context of human rights obligations of corporates. So in some of the other cases that I'm instructed on, which are the cases against corporate actors, often what you find is that corporates put out a lot of information saying we accept the global compact, we accept uh, the UN guiding principles on businesses and human rights, we accept X and Y and Z. Uh, and, and, and ultimately what they say is we accept that we have some sort of soft law human rights obligation when we operate. Um, and, and cases against corporates rely on those statements. And I think if uh, the if the European Code of Human Rights accepts that, uh, the Paris Agreement, the science of climate change, so on and so forth, are relevant to the interpretation of human rights obligations, and then that would also affect uh, how we interpret hu human rights obligations in the, in the context of corporate action or inaction. All right, thank you. Thank you. Um, all right, so, and how about the, that other ripple effect? This is there, uh, are we going to see now, are we going to start moving into more biodiversity litigation as well, or is that something that is completely disconnected? So this is, I think, a, a fascinating issue. Um, and when I first heard this question about will biodiversity cases follow the pathway of climate change cases, my immediate thought was, well, we already have loads of biodiversity cases in environmental law. Much of environmental law is designed around the protection of specific species, specific area. And all of these are really, really important uh, biodiversity cases. So that is the first point to, to kind of note. I think the second thing, though, is that we will probably start to see some of the more um, uh, sort of innovative aspects of climate change uh, litigation manifesting in biodiversity litigation, which is interesting because in the case of climate, really much of the litigation has been there to try and uh, address gaps where there isn't a climate specific piece of legislation that requires a duty bearer to do something, but there are other areas of law that can be um, in, engaged to say, well, this person has responsibilities to do X and Y. And, you know, if we look along the causal chain, we can see that that entails a responsibility to act on climate change. And I think we will start to see more and more of those kinds of cases coming into the biodiversity uh, space that will see more 
cases seeking to connect human rights and biodiversity, which is already happening uh, in a lot of cases, um, particularly in Latin America. And we'll also see many of these arguments that Mark was just talking about, about the responsibilities that companies, directors have um, to take these factors into account um, coming to the fore. So there, I think there will be a kind of a lot of exchange. I think we're also going to see more cases that bring biodiversity issues squarely into climate change cases. There's an interesting case that's just been filed in Finland, which is looking at um, Finland's compliance with its own climate change legislation. And basically, the Finnish climate targets rely on Finland's forests providing pretty extensive carbon sink. But actually, the science is saying that in the last year, those forests turned from a sink to a source of greenhouse gas emissions. So they can't now be relied on to offset emissions from burning fossil fuels and all the other activities that we're doing. And I think that's an issue where we're going to see these two areas really kind of coming together uh, as well. Yes, yes Mark. Yeah, I was just going to say that there's a case I'm instructed on at the moment where we're bringing a judicial review against the UK government for failing to tackle sewage in our rivers and our seas. And um, one of the things I noticed or um, began to understand um, as I was reading into the science and the science is developing, but the, the, as we pollute our rivers but then our seas, we kill off our seas. And we, we, we turn our seas from being a carbon sink into a carbon source. And, and um, so quite a part of the biodiversity uh, uh, within the, uh, the marine biodiversity, we're, we're, we're storing up yet more trouble for ourselves by failing to tackle the sewage that, and pollution that goes into our, uh, our rivers and seas, not, 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 not to mention the forever chemicals and, and, and other stuff that we seem to be quite happy to pump into them. So the, the case I'm uh, involved in, um, we've got permission to bring a, a JR claim against the government for um, its sewage reduction plan, uh, which you may have read about in the papers. And um, we're arguing um, not only that the sewage reduction plan uh, doesn't comply with the statutory requirements for a plan, but it also breaches the human rights of um, some of our clients. And we're representing uh, an oyster farmer or fisherman uh, uh, but also uh, a surfer who uh, enjoys surfing with his his son, but is unable to do so uh, most of the year because if he ever does so, um, he's at risk of um, uh, suffering E. coli, and so too is his son. So there is a there is an argument based very much along the lines of the arguments put forward in the uh, Swiss Media Women case. Uh, articles two and Article eight are being advanced in that case. And then on top of that, so we have permission to argue that the government is breaching um, an age-old uh, doctrine, the public trust doctrine, um, by failing to tackle um, the source of the sewage uh, pollution um, and allowing our rivers and seas to be polluted. So watch this space, but it's an example, I think, of you know, the sort of cases um, that, that, that Catherine was talking about. Thank you. Thank you. I'm very sure to put up on, the, on this. Um, there's a publication, a book called Human Rights and the Planet, which was uh, published, I think, last year, uh, yeah, last, last year. Um, and within it, at the start, there's an interview with uh, Judge Spano. And I think that is very interesting because he's, he's obviously talking about the cases before the European Court of Human Rights. And uh, what he says is that there's no real need um, for the court to radically change settled principles, uh, and that our understanding of human rights is, is some, somehow premised on, on the understanding that uh, we need a healthy environment to enjoy those, those human rights. Uh, and I think that's that's quite an interesting argument to then spring spring off and, and argue that ultimately biodiversity is, is intricately, intricately linked to our ability to enjoy human rights. I would certainly recommend that interview on, on this point in particular. Thank you. I'm actually, I want to get a check on the, that third question. And I also want to see before we start tackling that, or if there's anything more in the audience. Um, okay. Uh, but was control and monitoring mechanisms to put in place in order to make climate change litigation more effective or legislation more effective? Sure. Litigation. Okay. Uh, right. So control and monitoring measures, can there be any sort of measures put in place to make litigation more effective? But before we answer that, I still, because there was a question uh, in, in the audience as well, which I still want to pick up on. 
This is going to be our final round, uh, unfortunately. Hi, my name is Laura. Uh, thank you so much. This is so interesting. Um, I was wondering, um, Professor Boyd mentioned this uh, in, in her talk, uh, the current happenings on the international level with advisory opinions. And maybe this question goes more to Mark and Margarita. And um, what are your thoughts on, I don't know, maybe this won't even impact your thesis, um, but I, I thought a lot about what is how, how this will interact with, with the European Court of Human Rights and and maybe also in your personal opinion from a strategic point of view, do you think it makes more sense to, to bring a, a claim, a case based on individuals um, or to do what has been done and try, try to get kind of a broader narrative of, of, of an, an advisory opinion? Mm -hmm. um, okay, thank you. And there was one more I want to pick up on just, uh, if you can please break and then very brief. Uh, I'm not a lawyer. I'm a climate psych, uh, an economist, and, a, and, and an uh, climate scientist. And it is extremely likely that we reach to 1.6 degrees very soon. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, the most ambitious trajectory of the IPCC has 1.6 degrees in 2050. So I was wondering if there are have been legal cases against governments for not having done enough in the past. So this unavoidably um, exceedance of the 1.5 degrees is the result of too much emissions in the past. And if that has been developed in, in legal cases, uh, all right, thank you very much. Yes. So, so basically the burden of the past, past responsibilities there. All right, so in, um, I'm actually, you know, when it comes to control and monitoring measures in order to make the litigation more effective, I, the, the, I, I'll take that and just sort of briefly just flag up that what we do see happening in the field of climate litigation, it's a bit of a, a general answer to the question, but uh, hopefully uh, in this context it will suffice is that simply what we see is that the more kind of specific climate change legislation becomes and the more sort of, uh, uh, control uh, mechanisms are, are put in place, the more monitoring is put in place, the more kind of benchmarks and targets are put in place, the more also litigation has to work with. And we've seen that, for example, that uh, the, the first attempts to hold the UK for, uh, to account for uh, its uh, for its failure to do enough uh, to mitigate climate change, those first attempts were um, were unsuccessful, um, and that was in large part because there actually wasn't enough specificity yet in law and regulation that could be pointed at and, get, uh, and that could be pointed at as a benchmark that the UK had failed to meet. Uh, and more recently, then we've had a case where it has been successful with Spence of the Earth versus Base. Um, and uh, the reason why that was successful is because you actually had the litigants would show that look, they had to, the UK is supposed to make a carbon budget that budget that accounts for 100% of what is going to be emitted. The budget that they have made that only accounts for 95%. As five percent deficit, and that is not good enough. You need, if you have that kind of detail, if you have sort of embedded provisions, it also becomes uh, more possible to kind of create firmer basis of accountability. So litigation and legislation they can really work hand in hand. Maybe I can just add something yes. on that point, really. I think that's absolutely um, what we see. I also think there's a real interest in monitoring and evaluating the effectiveness of climate change litigation coming from the people involved in climate change litigation. Um, and we're at, at the Grantham Research Institute, we're doing quite a lot of work at the moment trying to understand the impacts of climate change litigation, both in terms of how judicial judgments get implemented and also some of the other kinds of effects of those those sorts of cases so that is something that's happening um and there are you know sort of a number of different methodologies that you can try and use to understand this um, but the impetus for that is really coming from uh people wanting to understand whether the cases that are being brought are you know the best use of all of the time and effort and resources or whether there might be other avenues that are more effective and and the way in which to use that so i think that's a really important element of this question about absolutely um, effectiveness of litigation 
Thank you. And then if we can move to advisory opinions. Yeah, uh, I mean, I was going to say that um, my, my main concern would be that the European Court of Human Rights um, delays uh, giving its judgment in the three cases that are currently before it, uh, waiting for the advisory opinion. Um, I, I hope that won't happen, but, but then again, I, we don't know what the judges are thinking, so <laughs> uh, we don't have a crystal ball and we can't um, work out whether they're necessarily in agreement with our arguments, but, but we, we really hope that they are and they don't need the advisory opinion to reach the conclusion that we would like them to reach. Um, so that's that's one concern. We, it will take a, a while for the um, International Court of Justice to take all the uh, representations from member states, um, NGOs, and uh, international NGOs and the like, um, and then, uh, uh, as it were, work out what what, what to advise. But um, uh, I do know that the, the court is obviously scheduling the Novacino case in September, and I assume that the, the senior, uh, Swift Senior Women's case won't be determined until after they've heard from the uh, participants in the Novacino case. So there'll be some delay in the judgment coming out in that case in any event, and it may I suppose, uh, drag on a little bit, and we may find that there is a, a, an advisory opinion which influences that decision ultimately. But we can't recover in town. And then finally, um, so suing states not for failing to plan and not for failing to then make plans that are commensurate with the challenge, but for, for past failures, is that a kind of different dynamic or is that? Um, yes, Marguerite, can I just jump in on this one very quickly? Um, so this is just, I was looking for the reference in, in our observations, but um, we specifically rely on, on past failures. It, it again plays into this idea of a breach that is continuing over time. Um, and we rely specifically on the UNEP emissions gap report, which states quite clearly that had emissions, had measures been taken in 2010, less would have to be done now. And the same there's the same risk that that will keep on happening. So the, the less you do today, the more will have to be done tomorrow. So the argument is consistent uh, and addresses sort of past failure to act or acting inconsistently with, um, with the reality of climate change and then sort of present failure to act or acting inconsistently with climate change leading to impacts. Um, yeah, I, I don't know how that I was just going to say that we, I mean, we've been, we are the same thing um, but at the same point but at the same time we also pointed to the fact that the Swift government had uh, a responsibility for its historical emissions which should influence the determination of its fair share of, of what targets it should now affect and that is part of the equity that should play into feed into the determination of the fair share of any government state. I mean I'm not I, I haven't been involved in any cases where individuals uh, or perhaps groups have sued states for that uh, as a as the compensation or damage uh, for um, the, the, um, uh, the their past um, uh, inability to tackle climate change. But obviously we know that the part of the weakness um, is, is equal to damages. And it may be that it's very much, well, it's very much based on a corporation's involvement in, in global emissions up to date. Yeah, and there also are a number of cases against governments on that issue. So there's a case in Paris in France that was challenging the French government's not not the way in which their emissions had contributed to getting us to an unsafe temperature rise already, but the fact that they had failed to meet their own emissions reduction targets for, for 2020, uh, and they were, they were ordered to pay ecological damage. And there's also the group of cases that Mark mentioned earlier, the cases uh, brought or supported by our Children's Trust in the US, which are also looking at um, uh, the way in which an ongoing pattern of behaviour by the US government in supporting and promoting the use of fossil fuels is contributing to, to ongoing harm. So I think we will see more and more of that. I think they do give rise to a really interesting and challenging legal question, which is what does the court do when the government has failed to, um, uh, to act in this way? You can see that the harm has occurred, but it's quite difficult for the court to figure out what the order they give is to resolve the issue. So in the case of the, um, in the French case, you know, they could order the, the uh, government to correct the um, failure to reduce emissions by reducing emissions more rapidly now. But as we run out of time to do that, or we run out of these windows, there's this kind of ongoing debate and question, like what, what does the court say if the government has contributed to these past harms, other than they have to stop it as soon as they can. 
All right, thank you very much. I'm afraid that we're kind of at this point where I can no longer claim that it's a liberal invitation of 7.30. So um, I'm afraid I'm gonna to have to wrap up, but I welcome everyone to join us uh, for the reception afterwards and, and we will uh, continue this uh, very challenging and very fruitful discussion. Thank you all very much.